Hi, this is Goich. Welcome to the Doorway to the World. Today is a Life of David, episode one. The New Hope. Well, it's not the Star Wars, but Israel has New Hope. Well, this episode one, Life of David, we're going to talk about early years of David, his birth and his youth. Well, very interesting. Well, as I said, you can, uh, this is pivotal point of Israel's uh, history. They are changing into the kingdom from time of judges. And then you can read this early year, the episode one, uh, Life of David story in 1 Samuel chapter 16 to chapter 20. Okay, David. David was born in Bethlehem. Well, it sounds familiar, isn't it? We've had that quite recently. Last Christmas. Oh, that's Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Well, it's a coincidence. Uh, God doesn't run down, you see. We have something to study about. Well, David was born in Bethlehem. In around about four, uh, 1040 to 1030 BC, around that time, you see. And uh, as a youngest of, he was born as a youngest of eight sons of a man called Jesse. Jesse was a grandson of Boaz and Ruth. Do you remember Ruth? I did a session about the story of Ruth. And Jesse was a grandson. So David was a great grandson of the Boaz and Ruth. And he was the youngest of eight sons. He had seven brothers. Well, Jesse... David's father. He was a prominent figure in Bethlehem, by the way. He was wealthy because he had a flock of sheep, and etc., etc. And very, because, you know, came from the line of Boaz, it's always uh, the wealthy, one of the prominent family. And uh, also, this, uh, it was said that this Jesse was part of uh, some kind of, like, tri uh, tribunal group that Israel had. In a governmental system, in a, in a society like Sanhedrin, later it became Sanhedrin. You can read that in the New Testament. But, you know, Jesse was part of that, the council. So it's, he was a bit like a council of the town, you know. Uh, so, you know, David was from quite the good family there, prominent family. And interesting thing is, David wasn't treated well, not as well as other seven brothers. You can read that in the Bible, especially in between lines. You can kind of start as, start seeing that this unfairness of treatment from the family, you know. And there is even a theory that David might have been an illegitimate child on the mother's side, you know, through the mother's side, you know. So, you know, it, it's interesting whether you're going to believe it or not. Or if you want to have a look into that, there's uh, some articles, the studies uh, on the internet and in the books about, and then it's quite believable. And also that makes sense that the behavior that he had later regarding to the Ark of Covenant and Tabernacle David. Well, anyway, the theory goes this. He was the, he might have been the illegitimate child of Jesse's, or on the mother's side, rather, because he was not treated well among his family. And in Psalm 69, the verse 8, it says, I'm a foreigner to my own family, a stranger to my own mother's children. You know what the Psalms say about that. Also, Psalm 51 in King's, King James Version says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. See, and also, he was sent into the field to tend the sheep. Not the, any other, uh, other brothers, just him. He was sent to uh, tend the sheep in the field. And at that time, it's not the field like this great wells. You know, it's peaceful and nothing happens. It's not like that. In Israel, the Middle East, 
all those fields are many dangers. Even lions and bears are there, the predators like that. Because David himself said, I killed lions and bears to protect my sheep. You see? And those dangerous places, imagine, if you're a rich, wealthy, prominent family, would you send your own son, your, your own children, into the place of the danger that they might get killed? Usually people high, you know, in a high standing like that, they will hire someone, proper professional shepherd, and send them, don't they? But David was sent there. Not, not other seven brothers, but only David. And also, interesting, when Jesse summoned his sons on the request of Samuel, Jesse left David out until Samuel asked, is there any other? Then David was brought, you see. So from there, we could assume he might be illegitimate or wasn't counted as a proper son. Well, I leave that to you to find out because that's a part of the fun of studying. Okay, but if he's illegitimate, as I said, he explains later action regarding to the Ark of Covenant. You see, According to Deuteronomy 23.2, in Israel, the illegitimate person was not allowed to worship the Lord in the tabernacle with others. You see, they could not enter. And this suggests that David's obsession and his action of regarding the bringing the Ark of Covenant to Jerusalem and set, set that up the place of worship in the tabernacle he made not the tabernacle of Moses, who was, which was at the Gibeon at that time. You see, you know, he loved the God so much. He wanted, the pre he wanted to be in the presence of God. But if he wasn't allowed to be in there, when he became a king, he had the power and authority, he would bring the presence where he can access, you know. So that might be interesting, seeing the tabernacle. Well, uh, one little thing, a little rabbit trail. I want to mention about Bethlehem. You know, David was in Bethlehem. And also I said that Jesus was, in, um, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is an interesting place, you know. Bethlehem, of course, it was uh, the land at the stage of the story of Ruth as well. And Bethlehem means house of bread. So, also, so you know, it was a good, fertile place to be. If it's called the house of bread, it means a lot of crops could grow to make a bread. See? So house of bread there. And interesting, Jesus was called the bread of life, bread of heaven. You know, we, we take communion, the bread, as a part of his body, the symbolized as. And Bethlehem, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, house of bread. And also Bethlehem was a very well-known place for rearing a sacrificial lamb. You, you see, uh, those, that place, actually they raised the special lamb for this atonement. It happens once a year, on the Day of Atonement, they sacrifice the lamb, you see? And uh, Bethlehem was one of the, uh, Bethlehem was the place they reared all this sacrifice, sacrificial lamb. You know, uh, in the nativity, all those shepherds, who saw the angels sing, witnessed Jesus the birth, those are the shepherds rearing sacrificial sheep. They are special people. And of course, Jesus was born as the Lamb of God at the place sacrificial lambs are from. Interesting, that the little, little things there on the side about Bethlehem. And David was born in Bethlehem. Well, so David is a shepherd's boy, you know, went to bed. You know, and uh, things it's gonna change. He might have thought, "Yep, yeah, I'm gonna be a shepherd, and then one day I'm gonna leave this house." You know, maybe if I'm lucky, I get my own land. Maybe he raise up the sheep again. I'm gonna be a shepherd. Well, God had a different plan. 
as God rejected Saul as a king of Israel, you can read that in uh, uh, 1 Samuel 15, you know, because Saul did something unrighteous, displeasing in God's eyes. And God rejected Saul as a king of Israel. Now, Israel needed another king, you see? So Samuel was instructed by God to find and anoint another king. And God told Samuel to go to Bethlehem, meet Jesse, and anoint one of the sons as the next king. So Jesse went to see, uh, Samuel went to see Jesse, and Jesse presented seven sons of seven sons to Sam, uh, Samuel, as I said earlier. It's be like an audition to the king. Eh, first, next comes. Eh, that's not the one. Next, and oh, that, that he's looking good. Samuel thought eh, this might be the one. And God said, God said, Samuel, Samuel, no, no. I look, you know, I don't look at his appearance. I know, I know he's nice looking because I made him. But look inside. He is not the king quality. I will tell you who it is. Just don't look at the appearance. That's what God told Samuel. So I said, next, next one came. Mm, no, next, next, next. Seven sons rejected. Oh, next, oh, no more, no more. Jesse, have you got any more sons? It's surely you have got another son. Because God, telling Samuel, anoint the son of Jesse. So Jesse said, oh, well, yes, I have got another one. Someone get David out of the field. And David came. Yeah. Well, what's up, Dad? What's up, Dad? Well, do you know this guy, the old man? Samuel. Samuel! The judge, the prophet of Israel. What is he doing there? And Samuel says, suddenly, took out the horn full of oil and poured out the David's head. God damn it. What the? Well, I don't think David saw. But he was, what? He was shocked. And then Samuel said, I anoint you as the next king. He was about 10 years old. 10, 13, what, 10, 12? You know, before the Bar Mitzvah, I think. He was a little boy. You know. But nevertheless, Samuel, God told him, Samuel anointed David, this guy, this little kid the next king that's my chosen one that new hope well very much like a star wars isn't it you see luke skywalker no no it's, it's okay it's okay yeah so david was chosen but that was an event but life did not change instantly I think David went back to tend the sheep again. And I think brothers and family continue to be quite cold to them, you know. Ah, he's used to it, you know. He's almost becoming a teenager. Well, after a few years, well, life went on. After a few years, back in the king's court now, Samuel was tormented by evil spirit. Couldn't sleep on all those thoughts and all those things happening. Could be the mental health problem. People will say that nowadays, you're suffering from mental health problem. But nevertheless, he was tormented by evil spirit. And uh, his attendant suggested to find someone to play music to soothe his mood. This, you know, evil spirit away. So, uh, King Saul said, uh, go and find someone. And the attendants and people found David. Probably there are many other, but find David and said, there's a nice young-looking boy who can play the harp really well. And his name's David from Bethlehem. And you know, do you remember that Jesse, that, like, the counselor of the uh, Bethlehem, his son? So David was brought to king's court. And at that time, he was probably about 13 to 15. Uh, he was considered as a man, the grown-up, you see. Uh, the reason is, in verse 18, uh, this attendant official described David as the, oh, there's a David, the son of Jesse, who was a brave man. He killed the lions and bears and stuff. 
you know, protecting the shepherd. He's a brave man, he said. Well, in the Jewish customs, when the boys became 13, there's a ceremony called the Bar Mitzvah. You've heard about it. it they, when boys become 13, they are entering into adulthood, introduced into the adulthood, and considered as a man, not a child anymore. So that's why you said he might be about around 13, 15, you know, the teenager, mid-teenager. And uh, next few years, David, so David became appointed as a court musician, playing music for Saul when Saul was tormented by evil spirit. So next few years, he served as court musicians. But when he was not needed, you know, in the soul was in a good mood, in well, he didn't have to play. So he went back to Bethlehem, back home, tending sheep. You see, very much like uh, teenage musicians, isn't it? Hey, I am a court musician. Yeah, I play a harp for the king, but I need a part-time job as well. So he was a part-time musician, but same, same profession. That kind of things, you know. So he went to bed, so back and forth, back and forth, back back home, and then come back to the palace, blah, 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 went there. Life is pretty, pretty nice. You know, get paid, go to sheep, get paid, go to sheep, play the music, yeah, nice. Well, went on for that, like that for a few years. And in few years later, well, a few years later, Israel went into the war. Do you remember I said in the last session that Israel was constantly in a war with the surrounding country? The Philistines were one of the arch enemy. You see, because he was right next to the border, and the uh, Philistines always came and all rest of the war. So this time it happened again. Israel war against Philistines. Okay, the battle was fierce, and uh, but it came into standstill. Uh, for 40 days, says the uh, Bible. And why is that? Because Israel could not defeat this particular man called Goliath. He was a giant. He, he, but he, he tells us he's about nine feet tall. You know? And I believe that Goliath is a well known soldier. Imagine a nine feet tall, undefeated giant. He must be really famous. You know, one of the national heroes in the Philistine, probably. He was there and said, hey, anybody could kill me. You win, you know, that kind of things. Because he was so confident, he was never defeated, undefeated. So Galaius said, well, if you kill me, all Philistines are going to go back. How was that? And then some soldiers with Phil uh, Israel went out. No, couldn't defeat him. 40 days, and eventually nobody wanted to fight him. So he just comes stand still, and then first they're just ridiculing Israel. Hey, you said that you're God's people, you say? Well, I'm still here. I'm still here. And then Israel goes, no, no, just got. Well, anyway, so it was like that. I couldn't kill. And even so, it got to the point the soul said, well, if anybody could kill him, no, well, anybody. Kill them, I'll give my daughter as your uh, as a person's wife. And okay, yeah, okay. One more thing. I'll exempt the tax for the family for life. How is that? Anybody going? Still nobody goes. Nobody, you know, like a day probably wait. Pretty girl. No tax. My life. Pretty girl. No tax. My life. Yeah. Well, I don't want to die. Well, you know, so that was a situation, stood still. Here's David, you know, he happened to be back, back home, tending a sheep, you know, no, no music playing because it was going. So went back. And at that time, David's eldest brothers, the three of them, were serving in an army, King army. So they were in the front line. And Jesse, the father, said, well, they must be hungry, you know, like, it's, let, 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 let's bring them some food and supplies for them, you know, probably they need the different change and different, you know, new weapons, etc. Et so, David, since you're not doing much, could you take all the supplies to your brothers in the front line? So, I'd say, yeah, all right, then, yeah. You know, probably David's a little bored about tending the ship and heard about this war going on and said, yeah, I would like to go and have a look. Yeah, jump, on, jump on there. Jump on opportunity. So took the supplies to his brother. Okay. Hey, 
Hey, big brothers. Hey, brothers. Hey. I, well, Dave, well, Dave, what are you doing there, man? You know. And Dave said, well, I brought all the supplies for you. You know, they dad, dad sent me. You know, oh, all right then. Yeah. And then David, I would, so how, how, how are you guys doing? What's going on? Have you defeated the Philistines? Said, no, no. It's been standing still, stand still for 40 days, you know, 40 days. What's happening, David said. What, 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 what's going on? What's it? You, God's army, isn't it? Why, 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 could, why couldn't you? Beat them, you know, said. You know, why are you, why are you so nosy? You, you know, it, it, it doesn't concern you, that brother said. You, Bible tells us brothers are very, not very nice to David, see? You know, it's none of your business. Probably they, they swore to, but I, I'm not going to swear here. But you, you know, go away. You know, none of your business. Go back to sheep. You know, look after the sheep. Go back home and look after the sheep. You know, we're busy. And David said, what have I done? Funny though, Bible. So good, isn't it? You know, it tells us. It actually says, well, let's have, let's have a look. Let's have a look. Yeah. Because... Um, David, yeah, after that, uh, David, some of the campaign, take along with something, back and then fight, yeah. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, so where, where you can do that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 so, so, yeah, verse 29, yes. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. verse 28, when he loved David, so all this brother had him. They're speaking with the man, you know, like, what you see what's happening? The, he burnt with an anger. It's all the brother of David, yeah, burnt with anger. And... I get anger at him and asked, what, what, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? You know, I know how considered you are, and blah, 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 blah. And then David said in the verse 9, 29, what have you had done? I just came and find out, you know, I want to find out. I brought the supply and find out. Well, anyway, so David eventually found out what happened. This giant Philistine, Goliath, just stand there, nobody could beat him. And David said, well, I could do it. I killed the lion, I killed the bear, and, uh, you know, I could have killed this guy. It's only human, just a little bigger. No, not, not as big, well, it's probably the same as a bear I killed. Well, anyway, nevertheless, he, he, he's a gentile. I've got God on my back. You know that? You know, I was told from uh, when I was young, God on my back, I can beat him. So he went in the name of the Lord with a sling and stones. Surely he killed him. Defeated Goliath that no soldier could defeat it for 40 days. Now after that, Philistines were defeated and just went back. Any great, any great, in the name of the Lord, anything can possible. You see, that's where his confidence was. God with him. And we can say exactly the same things. World will tell you, there's no way you can do that. What are you doing here? And he said, Da, I'm here, standing with God. COVID, I'm standing with God. I can defeat you in the name of Jesus Christ. Go like that. And God will empower you, empower us. Yes, that's what the David did. And many teaching and preaching about that. You can find it in the books, internet. Go for it. In the name of the Lord, we can. Well, after that, you know what happened? Nobody could Goliath and he killed it. He became famous. He became popular. This young guy, teenager, went there and killed this giant and defeated, uh, defeated by teenager. Well, after Saul find out that David defeated Goliath, 
He thought, I could use this guy. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I remember his face. He played the music for me. I could use this guy. Hey, I promote you. You lead some guys on the, some of the missions. You So Saul sent him, David, on the missions. And every single mission, David was successful. And as he became successful, he became even more popular and famous. You see? And uh, he continued the success. And I think he became quite well known in other countries as well. When he saw this, who, who, what, what's a troop? What, what, oh, that troop led by David? That David, that guy killed Goliath? You know, I think that became like that. And so Saul made him high ranking officer. So basically, David started climbing up this uh, ranking ladder up and up because God was with him made him successful and soldiers and officers are very pleased the Bible tells us that they are pleased that uh, this guy seemingly undefeated mighty David becoming their uh, commander and all you know well and he was nice looking and I think he was, he had a good personality other people kind of naturally liked him you know one of those guys so he became popular uh, in a society among the among the officers and among the, among the army the military groups and uh, also well known to their countries see and at the beginning so I was quite pleased with that you know because hey that was a good decision he thought yeah I'm using him you know, I, I, I put them in this position and we are having a good success and winning streaks, you know. But as David becoming more and more successful and start saying, you know, oh, he's the one, he's the one, he's the one. He start kind of not mentioning about Saul. Saul became quite angry, anxious and started fear David. It naturally comes, isn't it? And when... Saul became uneasy about David. First thing he did, he tried to draw him into his side by making him a commander of a thousand. Well, I'm appoint you to the commander of a thousand. Stick with me. That's what he thought. And also, he gave him the daughter Michal. You see, well, let's have a family ties here, you know, so that he couldn't betray me, you know becoming son-in-law but also you know the Mikal the giving the daughter was a part of the deal of killing Goliath as well and then it's been quite a few years then well so Saul was doing that trying to draw him bring him into his side but David continued being successful more and more because Lord God was with him and so finally the, you know, Saul became much more, more and more suspicious and fearful and uh, uneasy about David and finally decided to eliminate him, means killing him. See, even he threw a spear at them, you know, because his mental state wasn't that great either, you know. So he, th he saw David as a threat to him, his family, and everything he owns. So he tried to kill him. At that time, David was about between tw around 20, 25 years old, early 20s. And David decided to flee from Saul because he thought, if I stay, I'm going to get killed by this king. I'm going to run, you know. Well, David, eventful life. Shepherd's boy became a soldier, became a commander of a thousand and hated by the king he serves well not only the bad things though happen you know like you know he he okay you know he wasn't that his home wasn't quite a nice place for him to be because brothers didn't like him and at, at the palace you know okay other people liked him but the cross people you know like kings and you know, the serving he hate him and but you know not all bad in his youth, you know, something good happened. 
and something really good. And that goodness came in the form of a man called Jonathan. You see, Jonathan was the prince, the son of King Saul. He was the heir to the king, heir to the throne. He was the prince, Jonathan. And the Jonathan and David became good friend, you know. Jonathan said, the well, Bible said that Jonathan, first time I saw him, saw David, met David, really liked him and became a good friend. And Bible tells the phrase, they became one in spirit. You see, you became so close. Interesting though, Jonathan was much older than David. Uh, when I calculated, it was about 10 years difference. 10 years, Jonathan was 10 years older than David. So when, when they met each other, David was about between, around 15, 17. So, and then Jonathan was around about 25, 28. So yeah, about 10 years difference. And, but they became good friend. Um, but interesting thing is Jonathan's attitude. Imagine, you know, imagine he was the heir to the throne. When things goes, things went well, Jonathan would be the next king. Yeah? Yet, he accepted David. I believe around that time, Jonathan knew or found out that David was anointed as the next king after Saul. Because that kind of rumor goes around, that kind of information goes out to the public and the people will find out, you know. So I, it's safe to assume Jonathan knew that who David was, that they, how he was anointed as a king, next, as a next king. But Jonathan still liked him, loved him as a friend. You know, he took friendship above his positions of kingship. Not many people could do that. And also Jonathan defied his father's plan to kill David and he actually helped David escape. You know, this is very interesting. He, I, I believe Jonathan, if he had opportunity, he could flee the runaway with David, you know? But this is my assumption between reason and lying. He decided to stay at the palace at his father's side so that he might be able to stop father pursuing David. Because actually, Jonathan did that in later, talk, talk to the father, said, do not pursue David anymore, trying to stop it. Well, so of course, father didn't listen, but that might be it. You know, I think he wanted to go with David, but here we go. So, and they became such a good friend, they established, made a covenant with each other. Three times he did in the course of their lives. And uh, they stayed the faithful friend till the end. Well, covenant. I mentioned the covenant here. Jonathan David established the covenant. Let's talk about the covenant a little bit, very simplified. The covenant, what is covenant? Covenant means that total commitment to one another. You see, it's not a mere promise. Or cutting a deal it's a total commitment it's an issue about commitment that's a covenant and it is often beyond the life by the way between Jonathan and David there was a big cousin socially as I said earlier the one was a prince the heir to the throne he was a monarch he was a royal but David was a shepherd's boy in the country became a soldier in a way, there's a monarch and common people. Prince and pi Prince and Piper. Oh, here comes story in the Bible. You see, Prince and the Pope, you see? So, there was a heir to the throne and a shepherd's boy turned soldier. That was a cousin they had. But they became close friends, established a covenant relationship to commit their lives for each other, regardless of those social status. You see, it was about the man-to-man -man covenant, man-to-man -man promise, man-to-man -man commitment, you know. And for Jonathan, I believe he had more to lose than David because of where, who he was. You see, you know, heir to the throne, he knew about the David's anointed next king, so he knew he's going to lose that, the royal standing when David became the king. Also, you know, he, he knew if he stand the commit 
his life for David, then he's going to lose father's approval. So he had a more to lose, but he decided value his friendship with David more than his status. I think that's amazing. That's amazing. That's the true friendship, isn't it? And once Samuel 18 verse 4 shows his action to confirm this covenant, you know, they exchanged something and then Jonathan gave three things to David. The first thing he gave to David was his royal robe, you know, the garment. And the royal robe identify, it's a symbol of his royalty, you know, his identity as a royal prince. And he gave that to David. What, what does it mean? It means that Jonathan said, now, you, David, is not the shepherd boy or soldier anymore. You and me are on equal stand. I give you my royal robe. It means you are the same as with me. You see, there's no class. There's no issue of class or status anymore. Me and you on equal footing. Establish the identity. You are my brother, brother, you know. And second thing Jonathan gave to David was his belt. And belt represents strength because belt holds all the, the garment and also the, that's where you hang the weapons and everything, the equipment. That uh, represents wealth and kind of strength that they have, possession. So they, uh, Jonathan was saying to David, my strengths, the my possession is yours. My strengths is your strengths. My possessions is your possessions. We share everything. That's what he, that's what he meant by giving the belt. And third, thirdly, uh, third thing he gave to David was his sword and the bow. Sword and bow, mind you, sword and bow. If he wasn't, I think it might be the custom made to Jonathan because he was a prince. But you know, like you don't choose the all those personal weapons willy nilly. You choose something that the he fit to him, fit to yourself, and then. That Jonathan gave to David, something there close to him, the weapon. And Jonathan saying to David by this action, your enemy is my enemy. When you're facing enemy, I'll come to fight and stand and fight with you. You see? So, identity, the position, the strengths, and facing the stand up uh, for the person. That, that's why he promised and made a covenant. And then Jonathan did the same as well. In, you know, like a, in the covenant exchange, he, they are understanding the commitment for life to stand for each other. And those three things that symbolizes that. Interesting though, someone else did exactly the same. And that's Jesus to us. You see, Jesus did exactly the same things in his blood covenant. You know, he made us into his co-heir with him you can read that in the book of romans you know jesus being crucified and shed the blood and made him made us cloaked us in his righteousness cloaked us in his righteous robe and made us into the choir with christ you see and he gave us strength he gives us strength not gave us gives us strength and everything every knowledge everything wisdom strength through holy spirit and he always defends and fight for us and with us. He never forsake us. You see, Jesus did the same. So this covenant with Jonathan David kind of a precursor to the symbolizing or the shadowing what true the real thing comes in Jesus Christ. So it, it's a great study, the covenant between Jonathan and David. It's, it can, you, we can go much deeper, but I haven't got the time for it today. So I'm going to leave that to you. But, you know, David, in, this, in his early life, wasn't like all happy, happy. You know, relationship with the family wasn't really great. That, uh, you know, relationship was his king, that the workplace wasn't that great either. You see, but something good happened to overshadow all those unhappiness. That's a good friend, Jonathan. And I tell you what, until Jonathan died, this friendship continued. And even beyond, we're gonna have a look at that later. 
that John David's start of his life wasn't smooth, even though he was born in prominent wealthy family. But people relationship, the incident happens. He was tossed about by the fate and destiny. The things happened in circumstances he, out of his control, but he kept on going, didn't he? You know, Bible doesn't tell much, but you can read in a, a Psalms and you can have a little glimpse of how he felt of that time through some of the Psalms that he wrote. So that, that's something I'm going to leave it to you to find out. And uh, his early life. Now, he's, he's, this shepherd's boy became a soldier, became a commander, but hate, and became a popular and famous, but hated by the king he served. Now. He's running for his life. Going to the second chapter of his life. The exile. I'm going to talk about that in episode two next time. Well, thank you very much and see you next time.